Dear compagnon, dear friends, um, dear Christophe, thank you very much for allowing to uh, talk about something that's very dear to my heart. Uh, the aim of my talk today is to share my thoughts and experiments about something that uh, I'm very interested on, because I believe it's very important uh, in our surgical, in our non-surgical life, but also because I think at the heart of it, there is a lot of happiness, beauty, and wisdom that I would like to share with you. Uh, and from gratitude. I mean, some of you, believe it or not, are my masters on this issue, in particular, Henri Bismuth. So as a tribute to him, I'll give his talk. Uh, the inspiration, of course, I will not reach to the Olympic masters of simplicity, uh, Diogenes, uh, and you see the, the picture here, uh, Toro, who went in a hut and lived there for two years, and this is all he had at the time, and of course Gandhi, who was, uh, uh, when he died, he had seven objects uh, on his belongings. Uh, more uh, practical, uh, modern philosophers have thought about simplicity. Uh, I would like to thank one in particular, Michel Puech, who's become a friend. And he's a philosophist of technology, and uh, I shared lots of ideas on this talk with him. And he advised me on a small little book, 100 pages, The Ten Laws of Simplicity by John Maida, a Japanese uh, designer and professor at MIT, who's thought a lot about simplicity. Ivan Illich, of course, one of the uh, uh, philosophers that was wrong on many, many subjects, but right on some, and Tainter. I will talk a little about it. Uh, I sent a balloon, of, uh, a test balloon, to uh, Mario Morino. Mario Morino said, well, interesting what you say about simplicity. Can you tell me a bit more? And I sent him two texts about the more political side of simplicity. And he didn't like the idea of having it political. So I will confine myself to the surgical and to the uh, personal side. And of course, but you can apply the things I say to, to the four components of our life, the, the technical one for our uh, craft surgery, uh, the work in extended, the relationship, uh, the hospital and stuff. And you can amuse yourself to extend it to the personal life and of course to the societal political life, but I will not go too much into that. And I will confine myself uh, mainly to the first two points. The structure of my talk I will dissect, explain, uh, de-unfold uh, the components of simplicity, what it is, what makes simplicity, very simple. Uh, the aims of simplicity, why it's charming. And I hope to tell you something new about that. And uh, uh, six slides on the construction of simplicity, which is not the subject of my talk, but of course, it's a very important point. And at the end, I will put a couple of disclaimers to avoid uh, a misunderstanding and uh, the accusation of being simplistic. The definition of simplicity, this is my definition of simplicity, after having thought about all that, is a form or a state in which an artifact or a process contains or displays, it's important, the word contains or displays, on, only the essential, only that to accomplish its function. And here you see a beautiful drawing that extremely simple, nothing more than what's needed. What makes simplicity? And it boiled down to three things, which are of course very important in our job. It's immediate. When you see something simple, you know how to use it. You don't need an instruction manual. A child can use it immediately. And this immediate, so you don't need anything between you and the artifact, the process, or whatever, that is one substantial component. The second one, we define it, it's essential, and it's self-explanatory, and it is reproducible. And these are the three components that make simplicity. You have to say, what is simplicity? Simplicity is this. I give you the talk. Uh, uh, Good, don't worry. Why we want simplicity, why it's so interesting. And in our job, there are, of course, very rational reasons 
that everybody, I, I'm telling you platitudes, rational reasons to like simplicity. Because it's efficient, it saves you time, it saves you money. And here's a beautiful example of something that has uh, been extremely simple to think and do and use and saves you lots of money. non autoclovable drills, just simply cover a normal Black & Decker drill, drill with something that can be autoclaved and uh, the uh, 20,000 pounds, 30,000 pounds that has been calculated to cost uh, autoclavable drill, you can just replace it with this. Simple. Third world uses this drill. Uh, efficiency is not only confined to tools, but you can simplify process. And that's another study, very interesting, from India, where they simplified coronary artery bypass surgery to the extreme. And they reduced the cost from the United States, $150,000 for bypass surgery, to uh, one hundredth of that uh, with exactly or better results. Just simplifying to the extreme the process. The tools are basically the same, but the process has been simplified. The other reasons why we love simplicity as surgeons is because it's transmissible, it's teachable, it is reproducible. And cholecystectomy, the, the simple cholecystectomy is the great example why it is such a, a, an important thing in our daily life. But I will start now to develop on something else which I, uh, I was unaware of that until I really started to think in particular with Michel Puech on simplicity and on the book of John Meda, which I strongly advise to you. Simplicity has something which is more deeply attractive to us, and that's why I entitled my talk The Charms of Simplicity. And I found a series of eight uh, items I will present to you that show that simplicity is uh, uh, bound with emotions, and that's why we like it. And I didn't know that simplicity had emotions, but I will illustrate to you that simplicity, we like it, we are attracted to it, and we can reflect why we are attracted to it uh, with emotions. And I think understanding these emotions, for me, has been a source of joy and of pleasure. And that's why I wanted to share it with you, and in particular with you, Henri. The first one is admiration. When you see something simple, you open up in admiration. You could have done that. I mean, th this is not, you don't need to be Picasso and being able to paint the blue period to just be elated by this. It's extraordinary and immediately you feel adm admiring to it. The second one is surprise. When you see something simple that works, you want to try it. A, a child uses a scratch, the Velcro scratch, extremely simple. And uh, you do it two or three times because you're surprised and, and you test it and it's great and it feels great because it's so simple, and, but it feels great. You like handling it. The third one, the fourth, sorry, is gratitude. Something simple, you feel you're grateful to it. I mean, the bipolar diathermy, nothing more simple. A current going from one side to the other side, daily, we, when we use it, at least when I use it, I feel grateful every time. And, and this does not wear out. It's not uh, something that uh, boils down. It is every time I use it, as every time I use a zipper. When, when this time it saves, the efficiency of it, it's great. And the zipper, every time I, I, I do it up, I enjoy it. Fifth feature, power. Uh, power, and I illustrated, but, but other retractors just have it. Power is a great feeling of being able to do that something otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. Trust. I put it here, the, the liver clamp. Something simple you can trust. And again, th this feeling of applying the clamp, doing a liver transplant, 
and knowing it won't slip because it's made so well and it's so simple is great. Of course, as a Swiss, I could not forget autonomy. Something simple can give you, not, not all simple objects do it, but some simple objects do it, can give you an extreme feeling of autonomy, which is very gratifying. I will now move to three other feelings that are interesting. One is very surgical, but not only, is revenge and rebellion. When you find something simple that works, and um, F to the people who try to sell you something more complicated simply because it works. And this is the studies showing that mosquito nets cut into hernia uh, um, nets work exactly as the most very expensive ones. And the feeling of protest, rebellion, and revenge is rather gratifying. Uh, two others, which, in fact, three others, which I find interesting, is endearment. When you handle something simple and well done, you get fond of it. And most of us have objects with them that they carry and they feel attached to them. I mean, I never travel without my chopsticks. And I have some beautiful, perfect, simple Japanese chopsticks that replace the cutlery that otherwise we throw away when you buy food in the station or whatever. And this is a simple, perfect object. And the Japanese have taken the art of endearment to simple, beautiful, perfect objects to an extreme. I don't know whether you've uh, seen the brush for the tea ceremony on, on a bamboo piece that is cut inside, folded, and it makes a, a, some extraordinary, look at it, on the side, just from a simple bamboo brush, and that is absolute extreme. And the Japanese have a word for it, aichaku, the endearment, that they have for objects. It helps to be animistic. It helps to be, and John Meda, as a, a, um, a Japanese thinker, uh, think, believes that everything has a soul, a sheet of paper has a soul. Of course, my chopsticks have a soul. And it helps this feeling of endearment that you have, but which I have, for instance, for, for small boys. Uh, another uh, feeling, and I'm almost done with the feelings, is seduction. You can be simply seduced by simplicity. Uh, an art critic in, in France said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication on a beautiful uh, bronze head of an actress in Paris in 1929. And the last one, which I think all of you uh, must have felt, is appeasement. Uh, when you find, and this is the inside of Thoreau's hut, uh, when you see something of that kind, you immediately feel confident in peace and at ease with what you see. You, you see the energy that comes from freeing mental space by living in a place like that. And he lived in that place for two years. It doesn't mean that he didn't have anything else. He had books, he had clothes, he had other things. But this is all what he needed. He did an experiment. He just one and a half years of his life, and then he never went back to Walden. But at least he did the experiment. I will move on to the last side of my talk with the six slides, the construction of simplicity. And uh, there are three main ways to construct simplicity. One is uh, by reducing complexity. The other one is by organizing complexity. And the last one by hiding complexity. Simplicity by reducing uh, is, I believe, the most interesting one, and is the one that I learned from Henri Bismuth. He said, this is the way you should write a paper. You should start with lots of stuff, but at the end, you should uh, end with only what's needed and essential. And simplicity, by reduction, requires will, thinking, but in particular, attention. This is something that uh, Henri Bismuth 
uh, attaches a lot of importance to it. S uh, will and thinking will not be enough. You need to concentrate, you need to be there to construct this kind of simplicity. And I think this is the simplicity most interesting and most difficult to construct, and we are not very good at it in, in general as humans, because uh, um, complexity or complication is self-generating. In a state of simplicity, if there is a problem, the natural tendency is to resolve that problem by adding a degree of complexity. And that is natural. I think it goes with entropy, and, and it's normal that it is like that. And uh, the fact of resolving the problem by subtracting complexity is, in fact, difficult. And uh, uh, there is an interesting book, I advise you on that, by uh, um, an historian uh, called Tainter, and he drew this curve of the diminishing returns by adding complexity. And he believed that the Roman Empire died because of trying to answer to the problems by adding complexity rather than by subtracting it. Simplicity by organizing complexity is something we are quite good at. And uh, I've seen it many times, and you've seen it in my talk, no need to dwell on it. Simplicity by hiding complexity. And we, you can quibble whether this is real simplicity or it is false simplicity. I think it is real simplicity. Uh, Ivan Illich, he thought that that was always counterproductive. I don't think uh, it's always counterproductive. I think there are things, artifacts, processes, in which by hiding complexity, we can do things that are so interesting, so powerful, so wonderful, that is something that you, we want to keep. But we have to be aware that it comes at a price, and we do not negotiate this price. We don't understand it, and if we understand it, we let it go, uh, as if it was impossible to negotiate this price. And I think it's important to negotiate this price, because some of the things that simplicity by hiding complexity offers are absolutely extraordinary. I don't think we can have them all. We need to choose what to have, but I think this is, is a form of simplicity, and uh, it is very important that we negotiate this price. Now, the two disclaimers. Simplicity versus complexity. Uh, simplicity as the opposite of complexity is simplistic. Uh, we need complexity. We admire complexity. Uh, some things can never be made simple. That's the tenth law of Meda. Uh, don't think that everything can be made simple. And uh, simplicity is one side of things. Complexity a different side of things, they are not just the opposite. And I think it's very interesting to think of them, not just opposite, but of things that can be compatible and developed in a different plane. And the illustration of this concept for me is best given by Bach. Bach, among the greatest complexity, sometimes gives you something that is exactly simple, very simple rhythm, and the only complexity is added by things that develop on a vertical sense to that. And I think this is a very interesting way to think about it, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk to bring us back to the simplicity of life. Are there some Questions in the audience or abroad? Yeah, typical, very nice marginal talk. Thank you very much for this philosophy. I would like to extrapolate to hospital and administration. We have reached now today the complexity in hospital when you they have three times more administrative than people who work on the patients. And I always say now, our hospital, we have enough to do without any patients. So we go to the extreme, etc. I think that fit perfectly with some uh, issue that we are facing now. And I think you could hand that, in fact, in, in your talk, because on a daily basis, you yeah. have to face complex, useless, in our opinion, problems that have nothing to do with uh, our, our aim. The second point, I just want to quote here, uh, Rolf Zinkenagel, who was the Nobel Prize in Zurich, who always say, you know, what science is, is to make simple, complex things. And he said, if you can explain your research in two sentences, then you have a Nobel Prize. Yeah. 
I, 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 of course, I agree with the second one and with the first one. The first one is very interesting because uh, uh, it's uh, the, the typical one. I, I showed uh, the, I don't know whether the slides appears, but I think reading Painter is very interesting because uh, it shows that by adding complexity, you're lost. You have to subtract complexity and the answer we had with the administration is by adding complexity. And in fact, the best thing you can do is to get rid of it. It's difficult to get rid of administrator, but you should try. And um, what I say for this kind of complexity is whenever you think at something, you have to add in uh, a ferry, uh, un lutin, un lutin simplificateur. If every time you think at a process, at the end of it, put in something, a phase, of just to simplify it. Sometimes you succeed. It's very difficult to, to explain that to administrators, but in surgery we do it. We do it all the time. We try to simplify procedures to the point that they can become reproducible, teachable, and that. I agree completely with your comments. Okay, thank, thank you. Pietro, of course. I, I like your talk. But I think that in our life, we are going to more complexity. For example, look, my car. I have a Fiat 500. There is only two with two needles. Now, if you go to a car, you have so many things, some you don't understand what is the use of it. So complexity is a way to attract you. More and more complex thing. And people like complex, even if they don't understand what is the use. I don't, I have the feeling that it is coming also in the operating theater. Uh, there is a, a, a dialectic. That's why the book of Meida and, and Illich are so interesting, because there is a, a dialectics between simplicity and complexity, and we are attracted to both. We are attracted to the simple elegance, but we are attracted also to the display of complexity and something we have to live with. Uh, I think we have to accept both, but to understand better the price that comes with complexity. And in, in my personal, more political belief is that this price is today too high. So we have to find other uh, ways to simplify. If you want to be attracted and to use complexity because it's attractive, we have to give up something else. Just a comment. We're lucky to have you, and I uh, really enjoyed your talk, as all the talks in the past. And I think you make, make us think, and uh, uh, I think it's very important for uh, in a surgical group like this one. And if I had time, I would, do, I would redo my talk to make it much more simple. But it's too late now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so.